Good morning, everyone. We are just about to begin. If you will wait one minute, I want to begin the recording. Excellent. The meeting session is now being recorded. So I'm James Fennessy, Associate Dean in Liberal Arts at Southern New Hampshire University. Good morning, and good day to those of us joining us internationally. Before we begin, I want to take a moment to cover some of the technical aspects of today's symposium. Throughout the day, you'll have opportunities to interact with the keynote speakers and panels during the Q&A sessions. If you have a question during these times, please click on the person icon at the top of the screen to raise your hand. You'll note I've circled the person icon in blue and placed a number one just to demonstrate the process that you would use. I will then introduce the question asker, at which point you can click on the microphone icon to activate your microphone, and you'll see the micro microphone icon just to the left of the person icon. Given the size of our attendee population, we do not have the opportunity to test everyone's microphone. Rest assured, we conducted an extensive technology test this week to guarantee the functionality of all symposium tools. Given the dynamic nature of an online symposium and the number of attendees, we will also not have an option for written questions or a text chat window. We want the focus of today to be your voices. We do have one change to the symposium program. Unfortunately, Julia Dumas, a presenter on panel one, is unable to join us today. This will be the fully, first fully online symposium that we have hosted, and my hope is that it creates the potential for similar events in the future both internally and in collaboration with outside organizations. A fully digital conference or symposium helps to eliminate the constraints of geography and costs that can often prevent scholars and the public from attending these events. By expanding access through digital tools, we can create a more robust conversation around important academic topics and develop a far-reaching community of scholarship that transcends the hallowed halls of academia and creates more opportunity to fully engage the public. But enough of these general comments. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to the Southern New Hampshire University and International Committee for Museology Symposium on Defining the Museum of the 21st Century, where we explore evolving multiculturalism in museums in the United States. We are honored to partner with the International Council of Museums in this important endeavor. I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the efforts of Dr. Susie Chung, a trusted colleague, a core member of our public history program at SNHU, and the driving force behind making this symposium a reality. Susie, thank you for the selfless hours of your own time that you gave in planning, coordinating, and promoting this symposium as you travel to museums and conferences around the world. I would also like to thank Dr. Rob Denning, our history department faculty lead. Rob assisted in the coordination of our symposium, created the informational website that most of you visited, and spent hours recording and editing interviews with the academics and museologists joining us today. And if you haven't had a chance to listen to those podcasts, um, we can also share the link to our Working Historians podcast. I would like to extend a special thank you as well to Pete Davies, our marketing partner, for all of his assistance, Laurie Stein, our associate, associate Dean of Programs in Liberal Arts, and the larger Liberal Arts Department for their assistance and support in making this symposium a reality. Establishing a clear definition for museums in the 21st century is no small endeavor. Museums in the U.S. have long been contested spaces and battlegrounds in the nation's culture wars, even if this is not common knowledge to the general public. I would guess that the majority of people do not think about the research, planning, coordination, and sometimes political dealings that are part of a museum exhibition. I was actually unaware of this entire process for the vast majority of my life. As many others who visit museums each year, I saw a museum as simply a repository of artifacts on display, either as solo pieces or part of an exhibit. In prior times, only a small population of those creating exhibits and visiting them probably considered the politics and power dynamics involved in acquiring the pieces for these exhibits, such as items taken from colonial holdings and presented in the museums of the imperial powers, or how they were displayed and explained as part of the creator's positioning in a larger cultural narrative of power. I definitely did not consider these invisible structures as a preteen during my visit to the Kent Delord House Museum, an historic house located in Plattsburgh, New York, that displays portraits and objects created and owned by generations of the Kent Delord family. For me, this museum simply displayed history. It did not engage in political conversations or interpret the past. It simply preserved and protected it. 
while my youth and the culture and the local nature of this collection might excuse my naivete regarding the purposes and dynamic nature of museums, I do not think that I was alone in my views. Years later, my research led me to Edward T. Linenthal and Tom Engelhart's 1996 History Wars, the Enola Gay and the Battle and Other Battles for the American Past. The essays in Linenthal and Engelhart's collection introduced me to a museum controversy set during America's culture wars in the 90s specifically surrounding the 1995 Smithsonian Air and Space exhibit on the Enola Gay, the World War II B-29 aircraft that dropped atomic bomb on Hiroshima to secure Japan's surrender and end the conflict in the Pacific. The planned exhibit sparked intense debate about not only the interpretation of events presented, but also about the nature of museums, the power of public memorials and national myths, and the competing agendas of various people and groups that negotiate, plan, oppose, and eventually cooperate to realize an exhibition. I will not relate the specifics of this debate, but many of the same themes have recently resurfaced with the controversies surrounding Civil War memorials and their place in US history. Are these memorials icons of the past, images of aggression, relators of history, or chess pieces in current political debates? Or can they be all of these things, as well as a range of other descriptors that demonstrate how the past is never simply the past, and that museums, memorials, and other monuments are not simply innocent displays or depictions. They are signifiers that hold deep meaning not only in the context of their creation, but also in relation to how they continue to be presented, interpreted, and used in current times. These debates do not only occur in the US. At the beginning of 2018, the Manchester Art Gallery in England temporarily removed from display Hylas and the Nymphs by J.W. Waterhouse. The curator, Claire Ganaway, stated that the move was to challenge the Victorian fantasy of depicting women either as passive beautiful objects or femme fatales. The removal of the painting was filmed as a video art piece for Sandra Boyce's March exhibition at the same museum, and the gallery invited visitors to share their thoughts on the removal of the piece. This resulted in mixed reactions from the public. Boyce also reflected on the reasoning behind the gallery's actions and her participation in the event, noting that she considers the museum as a place to explore new meanings and to forge new relationships between people and art, never allowing the past to simply sit still. This temporary removal did spark debate, and whether one considered it censorship or art in action, it demonstrates that museums continue to be contested spaces with conflicting views on their role. Should they simply preserve, present, and protect the past? Or should they engage audiences in current debates as our societies continue to wrestle with concepts of gender, race, ethnicity, and culture? And what about spaces that are museums only in name, such as the Museum of Candy, the Selfie Museum, and the Museum of Ice Cream in San Francisco, which I recently visited? Do these spaces demonstrate our changing concept of the museum? Or do they undermine the trust placed in cultural institutions, perhaps altering our relationship to culture, art, and commerce in the process? a concern voiced by Mitchell Kuga, a culture writer and editor of SALT. The corporate sponsorship of these spaces, spaces is explicit, and the US federal government and organizations like ICOM would balk at the idea of giving them official accreditation, which formally recognizes them as museums and provides all of the prestige and access to grant money that accompanies such a designation. These self-designated museums also raise cultural questions regarding whether these are spaces that promote consumption or reflections on modern society? Will they simply be emblematic of the current zeitgeist and egotism of consumption? Or are they a challenge to the modern concept of a museum that will transform these institutions from spaces sometimes associated with intellectual and social elitism by expanding the concept to include corporate and populist displays and experiences? These are questions beyond my own research experience, but which might prove important in the following presentations. So I'm honored to introduce the scholarship that we will hear in this symposium. We are lucky to have an international group of scholars who bring a range of perspectives toward defining the museum in the 21st century. Their work and the findings of this symposium will add to both this symposia series and the important research presented in the ICOFOM study series. While not every institution designated as a museum need follow the same approach, a common definition will help both the institutions and the public to understand the purpose of museums, especially as we all continue to think about our own culture, the culture of, of others, and how and why preservation and display not only paint a picture of the past, but also help us to reflect on the assumptions and biases of both the past and present as we look toward the future. I hope that you enjoy the proceedings and intellectual discussions therein presented. We will now hear opening remarks 
from Dr. Rob Denning, Debbie Diston, and Dr. Yunchun Suzy Chung. Rob Denning is a faculty lead at Southern New Hampshire University. Debbie Diston is the director of the McKinnich Art Gallery at Southern New Hampshire University. And Yunshun Suzy Chung is an ICOFOM member and team lead and adjunct faculty of history at Southern New Hampshire University. I hope that you all enjoy the day. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our symposium on defining the museum of the 21st century. I am really excited to be here with you all today. This will be a fascinating conversation, and I hope you will have an enjoyable day with us as we discuss museums in all their forms and their relationships to the communities in which they exist. My name is Rob Denning, and I am the faculty lead for history at Southern New Hampshire University. I am, alas, not an expert in museum studies. I am a trained historian, and I share with museum professionals a passion for sharing information about the past with audiences of the present. Beyond that passion, and an appreciation for the hard work of librarians, archivists, and museum professionals, I have had, unfortunately, little formal training in what museums actually do and how they do it. Over the past year, though, ever since Susie Chung invited me to join in the planning for this symposium, I have enjoyed a bit of a crash course in the fundamentals of museum studies, or museology, depending on where one is located. See, I learned something already. To prepare for this symposium, Susie graciously facilitated a series of interviews between me, James Fennessy, who you just heard from, and with some of the leading lights of the international museology community. During the spring and summer of 2018, we spent time chatting with all of our keynote speakers, Francois, Alice, and Bruno, and all of our panel chairs, Anna, Deborah, Monica, and David. During those chats, we discussed the professional and academic experiences that brought them to prominence in the field, but we focused more on how they conceptualized museums. We discussed the roles of museums in their lives, the things that museums do well now, what museums could do to improve, and where they think museums will go in the 21st century. For me, all of these conversations added up to my own personalized introduction to museology course, without all those pesky details like tuition and textbooks and all that. I suppose this right here is my final exam for that course, so let's see how I did. So what did I learn? First, the formal study of museums is a surprisingly recent development. Though people have created various institutions to collect and preserve artifacts for thousands of years, it is only within the last half century or so that formal academic programs have arisen to study how museums operate and how to consider how they should operate. Many of the writers and speakers here today are among the first generation of professionals dedicated to the formal study of museums. David De La Torre, for example, was a West Coast pioneer in museum studies in the 1970s. And around the same time, Monica de Gorgas' school colleagues in Argentina did not believe that the Museum of Studies could ever lead to viable careers. The museum profession and its professionals have come a long way in the intervening decades. Museum Studies courses and programs now exist across academia. The Graduate History Program at my home institution at Southern New Hampshire University provides a concentration on public history which in turn includes courses on museum collections management, archival management, and strategic management. Today, a very well-trained core of museum professionals works around the world to make their institutions accessible and relevant to their local and broader communities. And they're doing so in a time of great change. The second thing I learned in my course on museology is that institutions where professionals work have been undergoing a long, slow transformation in recent decades. The museums of the past were grand experiments in maintaining, interpreting, and transmitting past cultures and artifacts to contemporary, mostly Western, audiences. From the old idiosyncratic cabinets of curiosity to the massive British or Smithsonian museums, these efforts were largely oriented towards middle and upper class audiences who may have been curious about non-Western cultures, but had no real desire to engage them in their own context. In many ways, this was another manifestation of colonialism, where people in power, mainly in the West, imposed their views of the world 
on people who were not in power. Lynn Miranda and Bruno Brulon Suarez used the term predatory museums in a recent addition to the Act of Palm study series, where they argued that many institutions in the 19th century, quote, formed their collections by depriving certain populations of many of their most valued cultural objects, decontextualizing such, object, such objects from their indigenous symbolic systems and recontextualizing them based on European values, end quote. This colonialist mindset, thankfully, became largely obsolete as we entered a post-colonial world in the late 20th century. So museums today often look very different than those of the 19th and even 20th centuries. Museums have begun to focus less on the acquisition of artifacts and building collections and more on the needs of the community around them and repurposing acquisitions and collections to meet those needs. Experimentation is not a word that many lay people would apply to museums, but it is a guiding principle for museum specialists today. According to Bruno, uh, museums are in a state of transition where indigenous museums and community museums around the world are experimenting with the museum concept in ways that defy traditional norms and forms. Some museums are shedding their old brick and mortar shells completely and becoming mobile and even virtual. Some museums pop up for a short time in one location and then move to another. Sometimes this is in response to funding crises or changing political climates, but often this is pursued as a way to connect with the local community because the people in those communities may not have the time or other resources to visit these more formal institutions. Latin America, I found out, is home to a number of these exciting new community-oriented museums, often in the last places one would expect, such as in the barrios of Medellin, Colombia, and the favelas of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. The Parque Explora, for example, provides an interactive science museum to some of the poorer museums of Medellin. This institution invited local women to share their stories and heritage through play acting. The Parque Explora also went beyond the traditional conception of a museum by working with the local community to replace piles of garbage with community gardens. So where scientists came to help members of the Medellin community tell their story, artists came together in the favelas of Rio de Janeiro to help tell the stories of some of the poorest neighborhoods in Brazil. Some of these community museums try to meet the needs of the local community beyond simply transmitting history and culture. The Museo de Mare, for example, includes a computer lab, arts and crafts space, uh, arts and crafts space um, and conference rooms for locals to use. A similar institution, the Museo de Favela, includes a Catholic chapel, film screenings, and classes on ballet and capoeira. Unfortunately, according to one news account, these community museums are often overlooked, underfunded, and undervalued, and are also under threat of extinction. Sorry, not extinction. Well, I guess it's extinction, but eviction is what I was going for. Community-oriented museums like those in the favela will become ever more important, especially with the devastating loss of Brazil's National Museum, and most of its millions of holdings to fire in September of 2018. By focusing on the communities around them, museums have become more inclusive in recent decades. Large numbers of descendants of African slaves in Argentina, for example, has prompted professionals like Monica Ristikoff de Gorgas to identify UNESCO World Heritage Sites along the transatlantic slave routes. Alice Sadongi has dedicated her career to bringing Native Americans into the museum world not as exhibits, like during the colonial era, but as equal partners. As Monica noted in our conversation, museums are uniquely able to facilitate communication and empathy between different peoples. The best things of museums, Monica told us, is that they open your mind. When you visit a museum with an open mind, you discover other things, other people, other stories through the objects. I think that's a very moving thing about museums. You discover not only other cultures, but you feel like being the other. Now, inclusiveness does not always mean race. Museum specialists are also engaging with other intellectual fields beyond the humanities in order to improve the museum experience and to improve museums' effectiveness in fulfilling their missions. Anna Leschenko has been studying data analytics, neuropsychology, and neurolinguistics to understand how people think and behave. Her work on the connections between museums and the various branches of science will hopefully help to develop better labels and texts and also improve wayfinding systems to help maximize visitor learning and satisfaction. These changes and ideas provided with us 
provide us with foundations for future change. In order to remain relevant to their communities, institutions like museums and libraries must continue to embrace change, but not everything has to be theoretical. Ann Davis has argued that museums need to find out what people enjoy, what is fun, what is interesting, what they want, and not just what the curator thinks is neat. Museums need to accommodate the community. This can be as simple as extending their hours of operation beyond the normal workday and providing air conditioning and seating to ensure the comfort of visitors. Museums should adopt policies that encourage visitors to engage with the collections and with each other. Don't rely on technology, which often does not work correctly, to foster that engagement. Focus instead on providing comfortable spaces where visitors can relax and talk to each other about the collections. Francois Mares has argued that museums should be places of recreation, relaxation, and enjoyment. Don't shush people, draw them into the conversations. We have seen the success of these community-oriented spaces in places like the Brazilian favela and in neighborhood libraries around the world. We need to see this applied more universally. Third, I learned that in addition to changes in the physical spaces of museums and similar institutions, we should expect museums to become places of activism for their local communities. As Deborah Ziska has argued, museums are inherently political <clears throat> because they embody popular ideals such as democracy, liberty, and community. Bruno Brillon Suarez notes that truly inclusive museums challenge the authority of the states, politicians, and other elites. Anna Leschenko told us that museums do not exist solely to tell interesting stories. They also recount and interpret uncomfortable and shocking moments in history. In the past, museums served as temples and forums for discussion, but future museums will serve as places of activism. David De La Torre predicts that today's youth will bring entirely new interpretations of history and museology to bear as they reach maturity in coming decades, and they will fuse those interpretations with new technology to reinvent museums and, by extension, their surrounding communities. Now, these are just a few of the most important things I learned during my crash course in museology. I have not identified all of the problems facing museums or all of the potential ways that museums will evolve. Doing so would take all day. I, I suppose that's, we are already planning to be here all day, but I think I'll let the professionals assembled here talk a bit about museums and their place in our modern culture and in our communities. This is an exciting time to think about a new definition of museum for the 21st century, one that incorporates all of these developments and attempts to predict future developments. This is a huge task, but it is vitally important, and I look forward to working with the broader museum community and everybody here at this symposium today to complete that task. Thank you, and have a great day. Hello, can I be heard? Okay, great, I think I'm on, right? Um, my name is Debbie Diston, and I am the director of the Mackinac Art Gallery at, oh, start sharing, start camera. Okay, let me start again. Can you see me? Okay, I think I'm good. Okay, let me start again. My name is Debbie Diston. I'm the director of the Mackinac Art Gallery at Southern New Hampshire University, which is located in Manchester, New Hampshire. I was asked to provide a short presentation on how the Mackinac Art Gallery at Southern New Hampshire University addresses issues of multiculturalism within the mission and vision of the gallery and the university. Unlike many of you, who are scholars and or work at very large cultural institutions. I am not a scholar, and the Mackinac Art Gallery is a small academic gallery in a rapidly growing university. As the director of this small but growing gallery, I am interested in the business of the arts 
and I am concerned with the most relevant ways in which we can make the experience and appreciation of the arts accessible for our academic community. And I'm sorry, I'm trying to change the, uh, the PowerPoint. Oh, here we go. Hang on. Um, I'm interested in the, uh, sorry. Um, I'm interested. I'm concerned with the most relevant ways in which we can make the experience and appreciation of the arts accessible for our academic community and our community at large. Accessibility is at the core of the mission and vision of the SNHU strategic plan. The mission of the Mackinac Art Gallery is completely aligned with that of the university. And here I give you the mission of the gallery and the mission of the university. The mission of the Mackinac Art Gallery, I will read to you, but not the university. The Mackinac Art Gallery, administered by the School of Arts and Sciences of Southern New Hampshire University, provides firsthand experiences in the arts through its collection, exhibitions, and diverse programs designed to support the university curriculum and enhance public engagement in the arts. I want our exhibitions and programming to be fiscally sound as well as accessible and yet account for taking risks, and to be transformative by presenting challenging conversations and experiences. The Mackinac Art Gallery at SNHU is an anomaly because at SNHU we do not have an art history degree, nor do we have a studio art practice. We do offer a graphic design major and a game design major. Many of our students have never stepped foot into any type of museum. The rhetoric of an art historian, curator, conservator, or any other discipline in the museum field is more akin to a foreign language with many of our students. The undergraduate on-campus community has slowly grown to be more diverse with inclusion of more people of color, different faiths, as well as an increase in the population of our LGBTQ community. The on-campus community has thrived, and by extension, the Mackinac Art Gallery and the arts have thrived at SNHU because we see the arts as a vehicle to connect individuals to conversations that address some of the most pressing issues in our global community. How have we accomplished this? Through listening to the interests and concerns of our peers, we were able to identify constant threads that would weave a story applicable to an array of constituents. This has resulted in the following exhibitions. In December of 2008, we offered up an exhibit called Distant Shores, Cultural Exchange in Contemporary Art. This exhibit provided themes of globalization, nationalism, multiculturalism, and ideals of home were presented in this exhibition. The artists included Ambreen Butt, Fred H.C. Lang, Raja Ram Sharma, Karen Menino, Shiva Amadi, Shelley Bal, and Um Ho Park. In September of 2009, we presented an exhibit called Visage, Portraits by Chris Bartlett and Daniel Heyman. These portraits created by Chris Bartlett, a fashion still life photographer, and Daniel Heyman, painter, printmaker, revealed the complex relationship between artist and sitter. The images displayed in this exhibit included portraits from the Detainee Project. These images were of Iraqis who had been tortured and abused while in the custody of the United States military and its surrogates. Both artists participated in this project with the Center for Constitu Constitutional Rights, a nonprofit legal and educational organization committed to the creative use of law as a positive force for social change. In November of 2009, we provided an exhibit called Notes from the Field, Learning Through Service. 
This exhibit presented visual and written reflections, inviting visitors to explore the relationship between scholarship and service. The photographs, books, posters, public service announcements, and journals on display focused on the service learning program at Southern New Hampshire University. This program aims to expand the classroom beyond the confines of the campus and into the community at large. The following testimony by student Ashley Backelder, class of 2009, <clears throat> um, is an expression of her experience and the impact of multicultural experience. Quote, New England has become home to a sizable community of refugees from the war-torn country of Somalia, fleeing the threat of starvation and violence in their home, in their home country's civil war. Excuse me, I didn't move on to the next slide. Um, fleeing the threat of starvation and violence in their home country's civil war, Somalis arrive in New England region hearing the traumas of war, poverty, and the disruption of migration halfway across the world. Nearly 10,000 Somalis live in New England, 300 of which are settled in Manchester, New Hampshire. Those in Manchester go largely unnoticed by the local residents, myself included. The Somali men, women, and children face the challenges of acclimating not only to a new city, but to a new way of life. They rely heavily on the few public organizations that successfully provide culturally sensitive and supportive services and often struggle through their first years. My view, writes Ashley of Manchester, was drastically changed and I set out to connect myself in the very population I had unknowingly ignored. I worked first as a volunteer among the newly resettled refugees and more recently explored their lives through photography. And of course, the slides you see on the screen is a photograph by Ashley. Traversing Gender, exhibited in September through October of 2010, was an exhibition of collections that demonstrated tra a traversing of gendered genders represented in contemporary art and provided an array of stories that reveal how we adopt various roles, either masculine or feminine, and how these interpretations are visually constructed. Traversing Gender was an exhibit that included political, social, economic, and religious content that gives way to broader implications illustrated in a disparate selection of photography, painting, installation, and sculpture. The exhibiting artists included Hannah Barrett, Jesse Burke, Caleb Cole, Jess Dugan, Lauren DeChico, Leila Isadi, whose image you see on the screen here, Eliza, John, Steve Block, Mary Ellen Strom, Tribe, Suzanne Sinclair, and Rune Olson. Um, the next exhibit I would like to speak about, I do not have a slide for, but I would like to share about it quickly. In 2011, we provided an exhibit called an AIDS Action Project at Artist Proof Johannesburg, South Africa. This exhibit was comprised of 100 black and white etchings by 97 collaborating artists in Johannesburg, South Africa, as a response to a three-day New Start HIV voluntary testing and counseling program at Artist Proof Studio, South Africa in 2006. Kim Berman, the initiator of the project and a resident of Johannesburg, believes that as an artist, educator, and activist, she has an important role to play in contributing to social transformation. This installation of etchings considered how artists can use their work as a catalyst for change. Social issues affecting South Africa, such as the losses and devastation caused by HIV AIDS pandemic are reflected in the artist's work. This next slide represents an exhibit that we held in February to April of 2014. It was work by an artist named Linda Bond, and the title of the exhibit was Shadow War. In this exhibition, Shadow War, Linda Bond explored the experience of war filtered through the lens of our media-saturated culture. 
The work she has produced during more than a decade of American combat in Iraq and Afghanistan examines some of the difficult questions warfare imposes. With compassion, she touches the human suffering central to the tragedies afflicted upon both sides of a conflict, challenging our perceptions of good and evil, hero and enemy, terrorist and victim. What makes a moral society is the central question of what Bond is addressing. I've also provided a PDF of the catalog for this exhibit in case any of you are interested in reviewing that further. <clears throat> this last slide represents an exhibit called Still Lights from a Vanishing City that we installed and shared in January through February of 2015. Still Lives from a Vanishing City was an exhibition chronicling the reappropriation of colonial urban space in Yangon, Myanmar. The documentary, photographer by, the documentary photography by Brooklyn-based artist writer Elizabeth Rush is of a changing culture as well as an exercise in capturing a way of life in the face of modernism. Rush's poetic images introduce us to teachers, Mohinga sellers, accordion players, journalists, accountants, and tea shop workers living alongside each other and forgotten and neglected colonial era gems in Yangon. Buildings that in their heyday would have only belonged to the extremely wealthy. The allegory imbued in these photographs unleashes the ghosts of dreams won and lost and powers uplifted and suppressed. And um, there's, again, I, I apologize, I do not have a slide for this exhibit, but I'd like to share it. Um, I do, I did provide a PDF of the catalog for this exhibit. The exhibit is called Shigoya and Gonzalez, the Walls Around Fantasylandia. We um, exhibited this show from November to December in 2017. This exhibit addressed the subject of immigration and by extension, the physical, intellectual, and emotional nature of border walls built between countries. Enrique Chagoya and Raul Gonzalez III are artists whose work addresses cultural issues related to racism, politics, religion, and economic disparities. Cultural references are appropriated from art history, literature, and religious traditions. They employ a sense of humor about controversial subjects, and are self-effacing in their representation of their own culture and simultaneously imbue their work with imagery that evokes a strong sense of pride in their heritage. These are just a few examples of how the Mackinich Art Gallery has addressed the subject of multiculturalism. However, this does not necessarily mean that the trajectory of curated exhibitions dealing with multicultural content is what makes the Museum of the 21st Century. To me, the Museum of the 21st Century involves a variety of topics that address the problem of the brick and mortar structure, which include, but are not limited to, fundraising and the fact that philanthropic dollars are being stretched over a huge arc of humanitarian, political, and economic demands. Economic viability and understanding the limits of the return on investment and when to cap the operating budget. And last but not least, new business models that can infuse dollars into that budget. Can and should we sustain these pressures to maintain the status quo? Or should we seek alternative interpretations and examine what is relevant and support that? Cultural institutions, whether large or small, face the challenge in finding the right equation of mission, vision, outcomes, and cost. The definition of the Museum of the 21st Century should consider how the advancements of science, technology, and business development can strengthen the purpose of museums. The leaders in these disciplines have and will continue to be outstanding partners for the museum professional. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share my point of view, and I look forward to hearing from my colleagues.
We are here today jointly with Sue and ICOPOM to seek answers to the questions and defining the Museum of the 21st Century, Evolving Multiculturalism in Museums in the United States. It is the first time ever that an ICOPOM symposium is held in the U.S. and in an online platform that aims to reach the goal questioned in an interview on the museum definition process by the International Council of Museums, ICOM. How far can such a symposium reach communities? Our goal at this symposium is to endeavor to extend inclusivity globally through this online platform to collect answers through the keynote speakers panel speakers, discussions, and online survey with participants, and podcast interviews on the definition of the 21st century U.S. Museum. Though a face-to-face -face physical symposium may have its strength, here in this online platform, we gather to reach those who are in the 50 states and beyond to the international community providing a virtual room to collaborate. We sent out questionnaires to the registrants and this new community. And we will have a poll during the symposium that will be collected and recorded to contribute to ICOM's new definition following the series of international symposia. during 2017 and 2018 in France, China, Argentina, Brazil, the UK, Belgium, Flanders, and Russia. The ICOM definition of a museum was adopted in 2007 as a part of the ICOM statute and has been used as an international reference. A museum is a nonprofit, permanent institution in the service of society and its development, open to the public, which acquires, conserves, researches, communicates, and exhibits the tangible, and intangible heritage of humanity and its environment for the purposes of education, study, and enjoyment. To connect the relevancy of the symposia with ICOFOM's mission and vision statement, the ICOM International Committee for Museology is in charge of researching, studying, and disseminating the theoretical basis of museums and museology. We understand museology as the study, theory, and philosophy of the museum field and the ethics of its practice and function. The vision of ICAFOM is to foster development of quality knowledge in the museum field through the increase of members and engagement as the International Center for Museology. In reference to the series of ICOFOM symposia on the museum definition in seven different countries representing four continents, an official museum definition in the U.S. amongst the museum community does not exist. Another goal is to introduce what ICOFOM has been contributing to in the international museum community with foundations and theoretical museology in the symposia and the publications namely the ICOFOM study series, to be shared amongst the museums and academic community in the U.S. A conference that laid precedence to defining cultures and museums was the Poetics and Politics of Representation, hosted and organized by the International Center of the Smithsonian Institution, ICSI. The publications exhibiting cultures and museums and communities were outcomes of two conferences, by ICSI. This precedence of defining cultures through a conference helps to reflect on where we are today in the museum world. And in this particular symposium on museums in the U.S., the themes for this online symposium are nation building in museums in the U.S., 
collecting tangible and intangible heritage in museums in the U.S., and serving nearby heritage for all in museums in the U.S. These themes address not only defining a museum through a legal definition or a professional one, but also what it means to museologists, museum workers, specialists, visitors, indigenous nations, U.S. citizens, naturalized, native-born or natural-born, immigrants, migrants, refugees, tourists, stakeholders, and community members. These themes will help us conceptualize the modern museum, but we need to answer specific questions about those themes in order to contribute to a new definition of museum. So throughout the day, we will ask everybody here to consider the following questions. And in regard to the first question, a very legal definition of a museum from the United States Code of Federal Regulations exists, but it is not to restrict ourselves from re redefining the museum, even within the nations, to gain a more comprehensive understanding. Some aspects of the U.S. definition to consider include the difference between a public and private museum. The word professionalization should be applied in relation to establishing a code of ethics, training, policies, and plans. Museums should extensively apply the American Disabilities Act, ADA, within the facilities and programs. The ADA of 1990 should apply to museum websites and online exhibits. The 21st Century Communication and Video Accessibility Act requires captioning video programs on the internet. However, there are obstacles to ADA compliancy, such as funding and grants in relation to federal and state political status. In addition, historic structures in many cases cannot be renovated to become handicap accessible. Thus, the federal, state, and local laws that affect museums and how they have developed into the 21st century context should be carefully examined. Other questions arise as to what is represented in the museum in, in regard to multicultures, intercultures, cross-cultures, and trans-cultures. Based on the onion model, I would like to introduce the interlocutions of cultural heritage model. Then, the collections must be represented as multicultural heritage, many cultures, intercultural heritage, partnerships, cross-cultural heritage, blended together, and transcultural heritage, change in identity. For many people, heritage differs as the definition of museums vary. To provide a comprehensive international definition of heritage by UNESCO in connection with the 1970 Convention on the Means of Prohibiting and Preventing the Illicit Import, Export, and Transfer of Ownership of Cultural Property, the definition is incorporated into categories as follows. Although the U.S. legal def definition of a museum states tangible objects, we should introduce the subject of intangible heritage. In many countries around the world, UNESCO's Living Human Treasures System has been adopted with centers for training the next generation of the knowledge and displayed in museums, and the concept and application of eco-museums by indigenous nations and econo-museums by ICOM Canada are embraced. Thus, artificialia and naturalia as the beginnings of collections in private, semi-private, and public spaces transformed into the modern museums and adding intactilis hereditatum with the preservation of oral histories, songs, dances, rites, and rituals in various forms of recording evolved into digitization. Connecting the first and second questions, private museums should operate in terms of balance of public interest on the collections, many of which are funded by endowments in addition to entry fees. According to Larry's list, the U.S. has the second most private art museums in the world, allowing for many possibilities in balancing public interest. One example is the Berkshire Museum, 
where there was controversy over the sales of artwork to aid in the museum's overall funding. Museums may also see public interest in new kinds of social media targeted pop-ups and digital museums, all in all, conceptual museums. An example of a pop-up museum connected with social media is the Daily Show's presidential Twitter library. The concept of nearby heritage for all, locally and regionally, should be explored. Participation in the decision-making of programs and exhibits is a requisite in the 21st century museum. In other words, all programs and exhibits must incorporate evaluation from the targeted audience and community. Moreover, visitor experiences are essential in the integration of museum functions. Three positive elements in museums arose three decades ago that we can also think about to this day in connection with the above mentioned themes within the museum definition process. How much further have we come along since these three issues were first addressed? Exhibiting cultures had explored museums systematically, not in, only in terms of attitudes towards the other, but also in terms of how the strategies of exoticizing and assimilating fit with public culture in the West. The symposium and the publication examined the sacredness of objects and how they are turned into art objects from cultural heritage and art museums. As we are familiar in all fields of profession, it is the lens or the way of seeing the object and juxtaposition alluding to André Malraux. As noted three decades ago with the controversy of the last act, the atomic bomb and the end of World War II, and then a more successful one that included the planning of contestation outside of the Smithsonian Institution at a university museum, we should incorporate the multiplicity of context. We're constantly finding ways to reach objectivity in administering, preserving, researching, and communicating, which is untrue to the very nature of what museums do, being selective and subjective. When examining cultural heritage, categories of decorative, functional, aesthetic preferences, economic and social factors, visual and psychological impacts, and language. We should find approaches to view heritage through interdisciplinary and multiplicity of perspectives. The implications of how museums deal with censorship and self-censorship when defining whose voice the museum defines should be included. Museums of social activists identified in the definition of a museum in the 21st century Paris Symposium is another purpose of why they exist today. For example, the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum and the Museum of Mississippi Hist History have no flagpoles in front of the building, as the flag of Mississippi continues to symbolize confederatism. This role does not only apply to cultural heritage, but natural heritage, where museums should be actively addressing the causes and the killing and trafficking of natural heritage. As noted in the Turkish newspaper, The Hurriyet Daily News, are museums representing the concept of the Doll Diversity Museum? How many museums around the world tell the story of the indigenous people and their Holocaust or genocide with those remaining displaced in boarding schools as a part of the U.S.'s Manifest Destiny, or Doctrine of Discovery. The Heard Museum in Phoenix, Arizona, shares this story. Should not museums be purposely active in presenting this hurtful heritage? Then the museum definition should include the words living, incorporating living human treasures, comfort women from World War II, and living animals and plants, digital, professionalization, diversity, causes, and representation, where the museum is represented by the culture that it is associated, not only through tribal relations initiative board resolutions, but also representation of the board of trustees, 
staff, volunteers, and councils in the quest for the interpretation of multicultural and natural heritage, many cultures and species, intercultural and natural heritage partnerships, cross-cultural and natural heritage blended together, and transcultural and natural heritage change in identity. So now, after the 15-minute break, we will hear an international perspective from Professor Francois Meret, then a Native America Outlook by Chairperson Alice Sadonki, followed by the panelists who represent the diversity of institutions that fall under the present defi definition of a museum, sharing their papers on the three themes. After the third panel, Professor Bruno Brulon Torres will share his keynote speech addressing the Latin American experience of museums and the current state of Brazilian museums.
Hi everyone, I was just notified that there was no audio earlier when I was explaining the polls. Um, I just asked politely if everybody could please participate in the polling. The information is very important to the research that Susie is doing and to the outcome of the symposium in general. So we really appreciate your participation. Um, thank you very much.